Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jesse Lee. I'm the uh, Online Programs Director here at the White House. I'm here with uh, Secretary Sebelius with the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we've done a few of these kind of chats, asking, trying to take your questions on uh, health reform. Uh, we're obviously getting into the last phases of that uh, debate and discussion. Um, and we're happy to kind of have a new audience this time. We've got, we're on Ustream. Um, we've, we've got readers from uh, Yahoo News who have been sending us questions in advance. We've got a ton of great questions from them, way more than we're going to be able to get to, unfortunately. But for those in, uh, who are watching on Ustream, taking part in the uh, social chat, go ahead and drop your questions right in the chat. I'll be keeping up with the chat and pluck some of them to uh, ask the secretary throughout. Um, I'll turn it over to you if you have anything uh, you want to say up front, and uh, then we'll get into some questions. Well, like Jesse, I'm, I'm really glad to uh, have a chance to visit with you today and do the first ever chat on Ustream from here in the White House. Uh, we're in a historic week. Uh, the House uh, is gearing up to have a vote, an uh, up or down vote on health reform, uh, which hopefully will pass by the end of the week and um, move a bill to the president and the reconciliation bill over to the Senate. That's a huge step forward. and. Um, this is a good opportunity to answer some questions. Um, you know, there are some people who have said, why don't we just start again? You know, why don't we go back from scratch and figure this out all over again, bring some Republicans to the table? And I think the best uh, reason that we're pushing forward that the president really wants an up or down vote is uh, not about a congressional timetable, but there's some real urgency that I'm hearing all over the country from Americans who are open their health and insurance bills. Jesse, uh, you know, a woman in California who tells me her bill's going up 23%. She's got no other options for health care. A dad stopped me in the airport in Chicago who's paying $30,000 a year because his 11-year-old was born with a heart defect. He's been totally healthy, but this guy has no other options for reform. So the insurance companies are not starting all over again, and we need, on behalf of the American people, to finish the job and to change the insurance rules once and for all. And hopefully, with uh, a lot of help and support, Congress will take some action this week and next, and uh, we'll have comprehensive health reform. All right. Um, I, I've actually been keeping an eye on the chat for uh, a, a few minutes here as we we're uh, getting ready. Uh, we'll start with a, a kind of hostile comment from uh, Patricia Phillips, who said flatly, uh, this bill has nothing in, in it to help those in need. Um, you want to respond to that? Well, that's a pretty broad category, but so let me just take need as meaning either uh, can't afford insurance coverage, can't find insurance coverage, has no health care right now, and I would say in all of those categories, there's a lot in this bill. Uh, for uh, working Americans uh, who are at the lower end of the income scale, there are some tax credits, some help to buy health insurance for the first time ever. In fact, the biggest health care tax break for working families ever in the history of this country is part of health reform for uh, people who have coverage right now and like their plans, like their doctors. Not only do they not have to change, but uh, the Congressional Budget Office says your rates will go down. Uh, more people will be in the market. There's a lot to limit overhead costs by insurers, so it's going to be a better deal for you. Insurance rules will change, so if you're sick or have a pre-existing condition uh, and need help uh, negotiating with an insurance company, they won't any longer be able to push you out of the market, lock you out of the market, price you out of the market. Um, a lot of help for seniors, uh, less co-pay for preventive care. You won't have to put up your own money in order to get a cancer screening or have a mammogram. Uh, seniors will get help with overall drug costs. Uh, help for more kids who want to become doctors and nurses. More scholarships will be paid. More people in the workforce. Help for more folks with community health centers. A um, lot of health and wellness strategies. So if you want to stop smoking or lose a little weight or get some decent preventive care, there's going to be incentives to do that and help to do that. So I would say throughout this bill, there are strategies to have a healthier, more prosperous nation. All right. Um, uh, well, we'll take one more question from the chat before getting into some uh, Yahoo News questions. Uh, Joe Ping asked, how are you going to pay for this health care bill? 
Well, the good news is, Joe, that um, the bill is entirely paid for. Uh, the president said from the outset uh, he didn't want to do what previous Congresses have done, which is to pass some benefit and not pay for the bill. So there's about $470 billion worth of savings, money that we're already spending in the system that isn't going to improve health benefits. It's redirected, makes Medicare more solvent, helps to close the donut hole, helps pay for some of that preventive care. And then there are a couple of ways revenue is raised. Um, people right now don't pay a Medicare tax on their unearned income. Uh, so if you make all your money off the stock market, unlike your neighbor or friend who might be collecting a paycheck and paying Medicare tax, you don't pay any tax on those stocks. And for people over, uh, couples over $250,000, they'll begin paying a Medicare tax on that unearned income that raises revenue. We're also collecting a bunch of revenue right now in cracking down on some of the fraud that's in the Medicare system and getting that money back and putting it back to solidify Medicare going forward. But the bill is fully paid for and it will lower deficits in the first 10 years and in the second 10 years. All right. Um, let's see. I, I, we'll, we'll jump to this one from Yahoo. Uh, they asked about a health czar. Uh, I understand the bill will create an official cabinet position or health czar to oversee the health plan. Is it true that the new health czar will have the power to outlaw anything that is deemed contrary to public health? My friend, friends believe this bill gives the new health czar this power. The czar could ban guns because they kill and injure too many people and are against the overall well-being of the nation. Well, let's start with the basic question. Um, there is no new health czar in the bill. It doesn't exist, isn't created. Uh, so all the powers that are described as coming with the health czar also are not part of this bill. Actually, what's in the bill is a lot of private market strategies. Insurance would be provided by private insurance companies, not by the government. Private companies would have to play by a new set of rules. They'd have to compete for their business. They'd have to pay out so much of their premiums in medical losses. Uh, they'd have some rate reviews, so people would take a look at what they're charging. Uh, they couldn't any longer lock people out of the market because of pre-existing conditions, but no health czar, uh, no new rules that a health czar would uh, have. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Winzet uh, on, uh, signed in through AIM asked, any reforms to how insurance companies are allowed to work? You bet. Is that, that's one of the big features of health insurance reform. Um, People right now in the small group and individual market, so if you're self-employed, if you're a farm family with a couple of employees, if you're running a mom or pop shop, if you're a consultant, you're often out there on your own in a battle with an insurance company with your own health history, your kid's health history. You don't have any negotiating power. You don't have any way to lower rates. And too often, Companies are monopolies in the marketplace, so you're really in a loser situation. This bill helps to create, for those people who don't have any choices, don't have any coverage, a new marketplace. Private companies would have to compete, uh, would be set up in a marketplace. Uh, lower income families would um, have some help purchasing that insurance, but no longer could a company drop you if you got sick during the course of the year and they dropped you at the end of the year, no longer could a company stop your treatments in the middle of a chemotherapy regime, which happens each and every day. You couldn't say to a family, we don't want you because your child has asthma or diabetes. No more pre-existing condition for kids or adults. And they would have to uh, pay out a percentage of their um, premiums in medical claims, the so-called medical loss ratio. So we'd be able to look at what's coming in the door, what they're paying to CEO salaries and advertising and agents, and make sure that the vast majority of the money they collect is actually going to help pay for treatments. All right. All right. Um, all right. Uh, I, I'll, I'll rattle off a couple questions we got from Yahoo here, which are related. Uh, Candice Roundtree asks, there's already a nursing shortage nationwide. If the patient load suddenly skyrockets with the passing of this bill, what are the government's plans to increase the number of nurses? And Oscar Jowers in Overland Park, Kansas, says, Dear Madam Secretary Spilius, I supported you as the governor of our great state of Kansas. 
Um, I would like to offer you my idea of improving our health care, and that is to address the biggest problem, which is a lack of doctors. Well, I think you're both right. We have a, a shortage of um, health care providers, uh, but I think it's uh, wrong to think that people right now aren't accessing health care. They come in through emergency room doors, they go to community clinics, they find a way. They may not have health insurance, they may not see a medical doctor to get preventive care, but they're coming into the health care system. So, one of the things the bill does is get people a medical home, help provide preventive care and wellness care, so it lowers the burden on some hospitals. The Recovery Act, which was one of the first bills the president signed, had a major investment in new health care workforce. More doctors, more nurses, more mental health technicians, more practitioners. It almost doubled the number of scholarships we pay off to put nurses and doctors in underserved areas. Health reform continues that with a big pipeline for doctors, nurses, uh, technicians, because we know we're going to need more folks in the future. And we're also changing the payment system under Medicare to make sure that primary care docs and family docs, who are the biggest need in the system right now, are paid uh, more uh, appropriately than they are right now. There's a huge gap between what a specialist can make and what a primary care doc can make. And if we're really going to have a healthy America, we need more medical students to choose primary care and family care. All right. Um, we're getting a ton of good questions from the chat, getting through them as fast as we can. Um, I, I'll, I'll jump right into a tough one. And obviously, this is uh, you know something that's been a very heated argument on both sides. It's been talked about a lot. Uh, Ryan Bailey asks, I thought the president said that abortion wasn't going to be in the bill. Did he lie? Absolutely not. The president said from the outset that he did not want the health care reform bill to be about abortion. It needed to be about health care services. It should not change the status quo on federal dollars paying for abortion coverage. It's what the House bill did uh, in language provided by Congressman Stupak. It's what the Senate bill does in a slightly different variation of language provided by Senator Nelson. There are some members who still say the Senate language is not what we want. You know, it isn't tough enough. It doesn't seal off federal funds for abortion. We have had uh, not only legal scholars uh, take a look at it, but the Congressional Research Service, a totally nonpartisan research office, confirmed absolutely that the president is right, that neither the House or the Senate bill provide federal funding for abortion. Recently today, Jesse, as you know, we had um, nuns across America, Catholic nuns, many of whom run hospitals and work in health care systems, 59,000 strong, who again endorsed health reform as not only uh, keeping the current law on abortion policy, but making it very clear that women who have access to prenatal care, women who get some support for family services and potentially for adoption services have a much greater likelihood of not choosing abortions in the first place, whether or not they pay for them out of their own pockets. So they feel this is a major step forward. The Catholic Health Association that runs the Catholic hospitals across this country and provides care has endorsed the health reform bill. So I think we've got a lot of people who are verifying that what the president meant is what he said and is what the bill does. All right, and yeah, and indeed, I, I did see their statement. It was very, really passionate. Um, we, we've actually got that up uh, along with a bunch of other endorsements that came out today at uh, whitehouse.gov slash blog. Um, another thing you'll find there actually is uh, somebody just dropped in the chat the, uh, an, an article that is from the AP today uh, claiming that this plan would raise premiums. We, we've got a nice debunking of that also at the blog. Um, and in fact, as you know, premiums will be greatly helped for families across the country. Um, so one question we got in the chat was from Carrie Lake. Uh, how and or will independent aged college students be covered by this bill? Um, and I'll, I'll tie that into another question we got from Yahoo, which was uh, Vanessa Garrison. She says, uh, my son Kevin is 23 years old and is currently covered under my insurance plan through the University of Arizona. He has a pre-existing condition because he had leukemia when he was two years old. The Arizona legislator voted last November to allow 
only children under 23 years old to be on a university's insurance plan, but because they voted for this after the enrollment period ended, they could not implement this new rule until, until October 1st of this year. Um, so I, the, the question goes on, and you know, obviously these stories are, you know, everybody's got these personal stories, but maybe you can talk in general about sure. how this affects younger people like that. Well, I'm the mom of uh, two 20-year-olds, uh, both of whom are college graduates. That's very good news. Both of whom lost insurance coverage off um, our plans when they graduated from college. That wasn't such good news. One of the things that the health reform bill does is allow um, kids to stay on their parents' policies until they're 26. So that's a big step forward for a whole lot of young people in America, recognizing that a lot of people go into the job market um, uh, or graduate school and they really don't have an option for affordable coverage. Uh, if you don't have a parent's policy, you would be eligible to go into the health insurance exchange, the new marketplace, and uh, actually depending on your wage, probably have some help buying insurance coverage. So one way or the other, it's a big step forward for a lot of young people in America who right now, particularly with a pre-existing condition, don't really have any options for affordable coverage and can actually be in a pretty terrifying situation where they go without coverage altogether and they're one accident away from a lifetime of debt and bankruptcy. Okay. Um, uh, this is kind of a, a good philosophical question that's come up a bunch of times. and. But we've heard people argue that, well, why don't you just do these pieces, be more incremental. Seth Bassis says, I think we all agree health reform is essential, but why is it be being done in such a sweeping manner? Why can't it be handled in smaller steps with more transparency? Well, I would say, Seth, uh, there has been more transparency about this process than any legislative discussion certainly I can remember in my lifetime. Uh, hearings have been held in three committees in the House and two committees in the Senate, month after month, covered by C-SPAN, hours and hours and hours of not only debate in committee and amendments, but debate on the floor and amendments. Uh, lots of discussion. The House passed a sweeping reform bill in full public eye in November by a majority. The Senate passed a sweeping health reform bill by a supermajority uh, just before Christmas. And now we're going back through the process uh, with an up or down vote. So I would suggest that this has been a plan that has been discussed. Uh, there have been town hall meetings and outreach meetings and constituent meetings and phone calls and web chats and social marketing techniques uh, for the course of the last year. The reason I think it needs to be comprehensive is the healthcare system is complicated. And uh, certainly the health insurance system is complicated and it all ties together. You can't lower costs unless you get everybody in the market. You can't get everybody in the market unless you change the insurance rules that say you can't push people out of the market anymore. And the underlying issue is we also want a different kind of health system. We want people to get preventive care and wellness care. We need more docs and nurses. So all of those are pieces of a bill that actually implements over the next 10 years. This is a 10-year strategy to really have a different kind of uh, health market at the end of the day and a healthier America as a result. All right, um, all right. Uh, Jean Keem, if, if I'm pronouncing that right, sorry if not, uh, says, you locked the doors after Obama got elected. No Republican input whatsoever. You call this bipartisanship? Well, Jean, I, I would again suggest that you go back and take a look at this dialogue over the past year. Um, there were months spent uh, in one, just one of those committees, the Senate Finance Committee, with six senators, three Republicans and three Democrats at the table talking about dozens of ideas uh, because the Republicans really wanted to participate in. Certainly the President was enthusiastic about that. At the end of the day, they walked away from the table. The House bill and the Senate bill have dozens and dozens of Republican ideas, selling insurance across state lines, keeping kids on their parents' policies, changing some of the rules for insurance companies, putting people in larger pools. Those are all areas of great agreement. At the end of the day, though, there's a fundamental disagreement. Uh, the Democrats and the President feel very strongly that you need to change all the insurance rules. Insurance companies should not be allowed to pick and choose 
who gets coverage and who doesn't shouldn't be allowed to limit people's insurance based on pre-existing condition. The Republicans don't agree. They think that should go on. Uh, the Democrats feel at the end of the day that we need to provide affordable coverage for all Americans, the 30 million people without coverage. The Republicans disagree. They say at the end of the day, if you enacted their version of reform, there'd still be 30 million people without insurance coverage. So those are two fundamental differences uh, in approach. Lots of Republican ideas are at the table. We hope at the end of the day there'll be Republican votes, but I can guarantee you this has been a bipartisan discussion for the last year, and uh, there still are some areas of disagreement, but I think there's a lot of agreement that's already contained in the bills. All right, um, and for those in the chat, just go to the link that I just dropped in there. You'll find a pretty comprehensive list, actually, of some of the Republican ideas that have been incorporated over the past year or so. Um, let, let's go to a question. Uh, this came in through Yahoo News from Louisa McQueenie in Lantana, Florida. Uh, she says, Dear Madam Secretary, our company insures four employees consisting of three families and one individual. Last year, Blue Cross collected $52,000 in premiums, paid out $25,000 in claims, and still raised our deductibles and premiums up to 19.2% this year. We desperately need help right now. How will this help small business with the continuing increase in premiums each and every year? Well, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, small businesses are the engine of the economy, and I think it's one of the reasons the president has said from the outset, you really can't fix the economy until we fix health care. I talk to small business owners every day who not only are paying exorbitant premiums for less and less coverage, but who lose good employees because they go down the street or around the corner to get better coverage. So it's a kind of lose-lose situation. New marketplace will help. Larger purchasing pools. So small business owners will have the same clout and the same choices right now that members of Congress have. Uh, bigger pools and insurance companies will have to compete. Uh, you'll have some choice. I mean, right now, most insurance markets are monopolies. They're not markets. So in the case uh, that was just described, Blue Cross Blue Shield is likely to be the only company offering comprehensive coverage to small groups. So you don't get to negotiate. And third, the rules will have to change to participate. And small business owners will get a specific tax credit to come back into the marketplace, knowing that often they need some financial help they're trying to do the right thing for themselves and their employees, but they need some help to do it. So a major tax break for small business owners who do provide health coverage. All right. Um, we've got a few questions about the, uh, the public option, and I, I'm going to actually use one that we got from Yahoo. Uh, Randy Chun asked, uh, once passed, 30 to 40, 40 million people will be signing up for health insurance. Will this be an immediate windfall for the health insurance companies? I'm guessing that insurance companies will automatically get an infusion of $100 billion in new money. The public option could have been competitive enough to force insurance companies to reduce their charges. What are your plans to drive down charges? Well, I think that is a very good question. Um, I, clearly, cost reduction and competition are two of the focuses of the new marketplace. And competition in and of itself helps to drive costs down. They'll have a, um, certain kinds of uh, benefit packages that they have to make sure and, and have available to folks the same way, again, members of Congress have today, but um, there'll be some competition. There'll be a much bigger marketplace with healthy people helping to balance the risk so that, again, that will help drive down costs to have more folks who right now often sit on the sidelines because they think they can wait until they get sick to get coverage. And we'll have um, some authority to look at rates and to uh, make sure that companies are returning 80% uh, in a, a small group market, 75% in the individual market of what they collect back to customers. And if they don't, they're going to have to pay some rebates. Um, so there'll be an opportunity to really make sure that at the end of the day, uh, competition works, but also that people are not colluding to raise rates together, they're going to have to pay the vast majority of money collected back in health benefits. Right. Um, okay. Phil Hartman, literally just a second, says, my insurance will not pay for diagnostic tests. Um, can you talk in general a little bit about the preventive care measures? And You bet. 
Um, one of the ways I think that most health experts agree that uh, we have to move in this country to really lower costs in the long run is uh, move to more prevention and wellness, not wait until somebody gets sick or has a chronic disease and treat that in a very expensive manner, but look at the underlying causes. So um, there's a lot in this measure that really uh, helps people access primary and preventive care. No more co-pays for preventive care. Uh, tests and screenings will actually be encouraged, not discouraged. Uh, they'll be widely available to folks. Uh, more access to community health centers where low cost, high quality preventive care is now available in some neighborhoods, but not every place. Uh, so lowering the cost in the long run really is done by a healthier population, not waiting till people get sick. And that's been proven strategies in, in some areas we just need to make sure it's available across the country All right and uh, yeah that uh, preventive care has been something that has come up a lot in this chat it's come up in a lot of chats we've had and i know it's something that the president has harped on from the very beginning on this um, i'm going to take another couple questions that kind of went together um, virginia dare uh, asked she says her and her husband are both on medicare she says well i lose my medicare well i have to pay higher premiums to medicare Tammy Boyer in Tulsa, Oklahoma says, I don't think that many people are doubting the need for reform, but they are doubting the ability of the government to make it a reality. Um, it is a fact that the government ran VA and Medicare uh, very shoddily. Why didn't the government first take the step to revamp those programs and get rid of the wasteful spending? And I think those two questions do kind of tie together in a way. Um, so, do you want to talk about the kind of waste and fraud in Medicare and how that relates to not cutting benefits? Well, I don't think there's any question that comprehensive reform strengthens the Medicare system. Uh, it helps seniors uh, make sure they get their guaranteed benefits. It stops paying too much for um, everything from subsidizing insurance companies for Medicare Advantage plans to um, overpaying for various kinds of equipment, but guaranteed benefits uh, remain totally solid and strong. And the Medicare Trust Fund uh, continues for an additional 10 years. It, it makes the Medicare system more solvent. Uh, over and above that, we know that too many folks are still seeing Medicare as a great target for fraud and abuse, who steal money, steal Medicare numbers, uh, charge for services that were never delivered. Um, do a host of things. So the president has the attorney general and me uh, going after those uh, fraudulent activities. We've had pretty good success so far. Almost $4 billion just in this administration has been um, collected back in the term of indictments or settlements with drug companies and medical device. We've had uh, close to 100 convictions. People are going to prison. But it also sends a very strong signal that we're serious about this. That money goes back to make the Medicare system more sound. And I would say, overall, both the VA system and the Medicare system uh, have worked very well for millions and millions and millions of Americans. Can they improve? You bet. And we're taking that very seriously. But I can't imagine a country today without either a VA system for our vets or Medicare for seniors and disabled Americans. All right. I probably can do one more. Yeah, I was about to say exactly that. Um, uh, well, so this is a, a question on uh, children with pre-existing conditions, Melanie Lynette Powell, Nellen, and Arkansas. Uh, if the health care reform pack is passed, will a child such as mine be able to get health insurance? My son is eight months old and has been diagnosed as having sickle cell disease. My husband and I are penalized for working, so we are over income for all state-operated insurance programs. And I, I, maybe you could just, in closing, kind of talk about how this addresses middle class, people that are not, not on you know, Medicaid and those programs, but still can't quite afford to sure. take care of insurance themselves. Well, first of all, one of the um, changes that hits right away in 2010, if this bill passes, is insurance companies can no longer limit children with pre-existing conditions. So that barrier ceases to exist. Um, in the country right now, if you're uh, poor enough, you qualify for government-sponsored insurance, your children and or uh, yourself. If you're older or disabled, you qualify for government help with insurance. The people caught in the middle 
are working families who often don't qualify, don't have leverage in the marketplace, uh, don't have help paying for premiums. So new marketplace helps lower costs. New bargaining power helps lower costs. Changing insurance rules helps increase choices. And depending on the income level, families up to 400% of poverty, which is about $88,000 for a family of four, get some specific financial help to buy into the pool. Small business owners uh, who are currently struggling and can't figure out if they can continue to offer coverage get some help to stay in the insurance pool. So there's a lot of help. The biggest tax cut ever for middle class families directly related to health care is contained in this bill and that's one of the huge issues moving forward. Um, all right, well, th I want to thank you so much for uh, sticking sure. around some extra time for us. Uh, and hi you know, to my Kansas friends. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, by the way, hi to my mom, whose birthday it <laughs> is today. And happy, happy St. Patrick's Day. Exactly. Um, but everybody who's watching, please keep an eye on our Ustream channel. Keep an eye on uh, whitehouse.gov. Uh, we, we have a lot of chats like this. We have a lot of kind of great information, whether it's on health reform, any other issue you're concerned about. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.